And now I would uh, like to um, move on and introduce another speaker that, um, that we are, are going to have. And um, so I, uh, I personally would just love for everyone here to be involved in the uh, fight for sight. But I would now like to introduce Ashfaq, Cash Hussein. Cash refuses to allow retinitis pigmentosa to stop him from meaningfully contributing to society. He's a former electrical engineer, and he advocates for an accessible community for persons of all disabilities. He has received the June Callwood Award for Outstanding Volunteerism in Ontario, which is a huge honor. The Wally S. Reed Award for Volunteerism, for 20 plus years of volunteerism, and the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. Cash and his wife, Rana, have three children. They've been married for 32 years. And I'd just like to say that volunteering is a family affair for uh, Cash and the family. And the whole Hussein family volunteers at all of our events. And so we uh, are deeply appreciative of their activism. So today, Cash will, for a few, the next few minutes, share with us his experiences with vision loss. Cash? Well, thank you very much, Sharon. You know, I, I've been asked to be your inspirational speaker for the, for the afternoon, and I really don't know where to begin, you know, because all of us who've been here all day have, have really been inspired by all the discussions, the, prep, the uh, topics that we've heard. All our speakers have, have just been so open and frank with us and just full of, of information and, and knowledge. And I hope that, like all of you and myself included, we've absorbed all that information and, and have really you know, become inspired to, to become active, to become involved, and go away knowing that there is hope and that there is a cure in sight. So my job today is to talk to you about living with vision loss. Well, those of us who have any type of retinal condition know that this is the journey. And each one of us is on different stages of this journey. And I'm lucky enough to talk to you today about my journey in particular. My journey is, is one that's uh, had its ups and downs, its highs and lows. Yeah, I know I sound like a hockey player now. <laughs> but it's, it's one that's had moments of anger, moments of depression, moments of sadness, moments of anxiety, uh, moments of uh, just sh 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 shutting down, so to speak, um, and going into a shell. But it's also had its moments of happiness, joy, love, and support. And like with any journey, it has to start somewhere. Now, in my case, I have retinitis pigmentosa, RP. So all of you know that it's a degenerative condition, affects you at early stages in your life, and is with you the day you are born, but can affect you at any time in your lifespan. Well, in my case, it affected me early, but I didn't know I had RP. I didn't know I had anything wrong with my eyes. I just thought because I couldn't shoot a ball like Wilt Chamberlain or hit a tennis ball like Rod Laver or kick a soccer ball like Pele. I know I'm, de I'm aging myself there because I did grow up in the 60s. You know, I just sucked at sports. I was no good. But I was good in class. I did well. I studied. Did all the, you know, was great at math. And always finished in the top three in my class. So I just figured, yeah, you know what? The others can have their sports. I got my life set because I can study and I know which direction I'm going in. And my desire was always to be an electrical engineer. 
So I worked towards that. When we came to Canada in, uh, uh, in early 1971, I joined, uh, enrolled at Mount Allison University. And for those of you that don't know, Mount A is the best undergraduate university in, in <laughs> Canada. Western is closed, but yeah, it's got a long way to go. It still has that party school reputation. But Mount A was great. Small university allowed me to assimilate in well. As I said, you know, my vision really didn't uh, impact me whatsoever. And what was surprising was that, like most of you, your, your parents know that there is something wrong with you. And my parents knew there was something wrong with me, especially my father. See, my father was a, was a physician. He was a pediatrician. So he knew that there was something wrong with me, but he never let it on, never. He just said, eh, you're no good at this. Don't worry about it. You can do something else. And I did. I didn't think I was anything but normal. And that allowed me to do and live a really meaningful life. You know, life was good. What else could I want? Well, I did get what I wanted. I bought the car of my dreams, a Porsche 911, with the full aerodynamic package and such. And I did get caught for speeding. <laughs> oh, you've got to open up the thing and run it to its limits, right? What else are you going to do with a Porsche? But uh, I got married, and I've been married happily for 32 years. I had three wonderful kids who are now all graduated. Two are out in Calgary, and the third one, our youngest, just moved to Japan. So, you know... Life was really good. What else could I want? I did have to give up the car after I got married, you know, use the money to buy a house. So, eh, okay, so you make adjustments as you go along in life. And then, like anything else, you're faced with certain things in life. And when I was in my late 30s, I realized that oh, I can't see as well as I could. I figured, well, I'm you know, approaching 40, I probably need to get my eyes examined. I need reading glasses. That's all I thought was what was wrong with me. So I went to see an ophthalmologist. He looked at me and said, hmm, I think you should come back. So I did. He got me to chase his little red dot around the screen. He got me to sit in a dark room and flash these bright lights at me. He got me to be examined by interns who shunned these bright lights in me and went ooh and ah. And, you know, they had never seen anything like this. And I just felt like a guinea pig. You know, what's going on here? What are all these folks doing to me? But I wasn't, you know, that concerned. I just said, yeah, okay, I'll get over it. One day he calls me back. Now, we're around 1989, 1990, somewhere around that time frame calls me back, sits me down, and says, well, Mr. Hussein, you know that's not going to be good when he calls you Mr. Hussein, you have retinitis pigmentosa, RP, a degenerative eye condition. And my prognosis is you'll go blind. And I suggest you, wah, 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 wah. I didn't hear a thing after that. I just shut him out. I didn't want to hear anything. I remember quite clearly walking out of his office, walking down to my car, getting into the driver's seat, sitting there and thinking to myself, what the heck does he know? And vowed to myself I was not going to go back to see him again. And I didn't. I never went back to him. In fact, it took about another eight years or so before I went back to see any ophthalmologist. So you can all imagine what I was going through in those eight years or so. As I mentioned, I was an electrical engineer. I sit there in past terms, but I am an electrical engineer. I was inquisitive. 
I wanted to know what this RP was all about. So I went and registered with the CNIB. They asked me what they could do. And we agreed there was nothing. But, I, but that opportunity gave me a chance to, to meet others. And like most of you, that was my first introduction to other people with vision loss and how other people were living and, and using the white cane and such. In fact, it was at that time that I met a, a young graduate lawyer. His name was Andrew Burke. The, by the way, we were living in Halifax at the time. And Andrew and I decided that we needed to do something. So we searched around, and we came across this organization called the RP Research Foundation. So Andrew and I started the first London chapter of the RP Foundation. We started to do fundraising for them. We sold flashlights. We sold all kinds of things, raffle tickets. We raised a few hundred dollars here and there. We got doctors and, and uh, social workers and others to come and talk to us and make, us, make presentations and, uh, to us about RP, about genetics, and all these other different things. We were inquisitive. And so we wanted to learn. You know, this, th these are the pre-Google days, of course. And we did. And that RP Foundation provided us with lots of information. And that contact with the RP Foundation existed until it became known as the Foundation Fighting Blindness. So my association with this group goes back to perhaps way before Sharon even came on board. I don't know. But 20 plus years or so. And over all these years, I have been a staunch supporter of the foundation because it was the first one that helped me in any way of introducing what I was going, what condition I had, never mind what I was going through. Those of us who were in the session that uh, Colleen put on earlier today about vision loss and mental health will get a sense of of what I was experiencing, because everything Colleen mentioned was what I was going through at that time. And like most, I had to make decisions. Not good ones, but nevertheless, decisions had to be made. December the 1st, 1995. That was the day I hung up my, drive, my keys. I never went back to driving again. And this is even before I had gone back to see an ophthalmologist. I knew that my eyesight was getting worse. And I had to, some way or the other, come to terms with it. But I wasn't prepared, not even then, even though I had hung up my keys. I stumbled along. I got my white cane, kept it inside my briefcase. Didn't use it, but kept it there, close by. And one day, I was at a client's office, and I opened up my briefcase to take out my stuff. And of course, I opened it upside down. So everything fell out, my notes and my white cane. He looked at the cane and said, Cash, is that a white cane? And I didn't know what to do. I said, yes, it is. And he said, you know, my dad uses one. And that just changed everything for me. I just felt, oh, right, now I can talk about this because somebody knows what this instrument is all about. And that was a gentleman who worked with London Hydro. And we had this discussion about vision loss and the use of the white cane. And that was probably the moment, the turnaround moment for me that said, you know what, it's okay to use a white cane. Go out, use it, have the confidence and such to be able to do that. Just that one little opening that said, I know what this thing is and I know what it can do for you because I know the impact it's had on someone else. And so I started to use that white cane. Another date that comes is 
March the 31st, 2000. That's the day I left work. My job was that of an electrical design engineer. I was responsible for designing electrical power distribution systems for airports, for oil refineries, for pulp and paper mills, you know, anything that needed gobs and gobs of power. That was me. You called upon me to help you design all those critical systems. My mom would always ask me, well, can you fix the, hair, the, 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 the clothes dryer? And I would say, no, mom, but I can fix a system that comes into the house that, fix, that will work that hair dryer. So I, my employer and I agreed that it was time that uh, I couldn't carry on doing the functions of my job. And I loved what I did. I didn't want to take a second job. I didn't want to take another position in the company because I knew that if I did, I would only be yearning to go back to doing what I wanted, what I enjoyed doing. I had great uh, a team. I was, I was the head of the electrical group. I had a great team of people that worked with me. But I felt that I needed to, to part and let them carry on with their way and allow me to carry on with my way. Went home that Friday evening, and I thought, it's going to be great to be at home. You know, my wife's been at home the past 15 years, taking care of the kids. Now maybe we can spend some time together. Well, life doesn't work out that way. She decided that 15 years was too much to be at home. (laughs) She wanted to go back to work. That Monday was her first day at work. And I was left all alone at home. Okay, Dad, you can make lunch for us. You know, that's the kids saying, make lunch for us. Sure, I can do that. Wife would come home, is supper ready? No. (laughs) Do I have to do that? Yeah, of course. It's your job now. So I stumbled along, you know, okay, all right, this is a change in, in, a, in a career path. I can, I can handle this. I'm, I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. I can handle it. I've seen her do it all along. I can, I can do it. I couldn't. I couldn't. It was a struggle. And let me tell you, that struggle caused me to another point in reevaluation. You know, I mean, life had been good, but it was taking a turn. And it, and it took this turn for what really surprised me for was for the worse. It it just got me down and out completely. And and I really had to try to figure out where do I go next? You know, um, I was getting to the point where, you know, and and I'll be frank and honest with you because I know that many of you others of you have, no doubt, will have experienced or, or may even experience these things. You didn't want to get out of bed. You didn't want to brush your teeth. You don't want to take your night clothes off, you know. You couldn't stand sitting in front of the TV listening to, you know, opera anymore, uh, you know, and such. So I, I began to, to shy away and, and, and disappear for, from my family, which was something that I really didn't want to, but I didn't know where, which direction I was heading in. So my doctor suggested that I go and see a psychologist, and I did. My wife and I went together. Uh, she's been a, a, a rock and, uh, and, and a partner in, in everything that, uh, that, I've, that I've been through, and she guided me, uh, me through that process. Well, you know, I was thinking, yeah, okay, a uh, couple of sessions and I should be okay. It wasn't. It took 18 months you know, that's a long time, but 18 months, I didn't, I, I didn't believe it, that it would take that long. I thought, you know, I was okay, I was, I was strong, I was steady, I had lots of support and such, but yet 18 months is what it took for me to turn around and come to grips with what I had gone through, and more importantly, and this is the key thing, point me in a direction that was going to get me out of this quagmire. And what came out of that, that those sessions was a different person. It was a person that was full of confidence, 
It was a person that was inspired. It was a person that was charged up. As Colleen says, the gas tank was full, and I was just raring to go. But I didn't know where to go. Yeah, I really didn't know where to go. But those who have faith know that when one door closes, another one opens. And it was just by whatever, faith, fate, that I got a telephone call. And the lady at the other end said, hi, Cash. I've got your name from a fellow who knows another person that knows your sister. And she says that you have the right qualifications to help us with this task. And I said, what's that? She said, we're reviewing a standard that the City of London has prepared. It's called the Facility Accessibility Design Standard. And we would like you to use your engineering skills to help us navigate us through this standard and help us understand what it says. Well, I was ready to jump in. Here was, I could now utilize the skills and everything that I had learned as an engineer and bring that, those, that forward and start talking with other people and such. So I went to this meeting, and around this table were people with different varying abilities. There were folks in wheelchairs, those who were using canes, there was somebody who was deaf, and others. And this was my first experience in meeting other people, persons with disabilities. I really hadn't given it much thought. And from that moment on, I got my calling, if I could call it that. And I was all charged up and, as I say, raring to go. And I had found that what I wanted to do was to help others. I had been doing it all along, but you know, here and there and wherever else. I felt I could utilize the skills that I had to bring life back to a meaningful state for others. And I started to do that. I volunteered with the City of London. I volunteered with the Independent Living Center, with the CNIB, with the Foundation, uh, with the, in, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and anyone else that uh, wanted to call me up and ask me for, for, for help and such. I was a guy that couldn't say no, and, and, I, and I loved and enjoyed every minute of it. I feel that it has given back to me more than what I can give it. All these people that say thank you to me, I say thank you to them because they have really helped and changed me. I've been recognized for my work, and, and that's wonderful. But truly just seeing others move ahead, knowing that you've made a difference in someone else's life is the most rewarding uh, feeling. That, that anybody can, can really get. And the foundation has been one of those uh, that has uh, really been alongside me all, uh, all the way. And I've given back to it, as I say, more than what I feel that it has given me, but it's, it's a mutual two-way street. So the, the, the moral of all of this is that be prepared for what you're going through. Don't despair. There is that light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope. And amongst all of that, there is joy to be had, knowing that you can and you will live your life to the fullest. There's nothing that can stop you. As I said, you know, that white cane for me was, I thought, was going to be a stumbling block. What would people think of me? What would people feel about me? You know, would that white cane be something that, Folks would look at it and say, oh, well, there goes that guy. He's blind. You know, what, does he, what can he do? But it's the opposite of that. That white cane has given me independence. It's given me confidence. It's given me mobility. I have traveled the world on my own using that white cane, and there is nothing that can stop me from doing these things. So I, I urge you to look for things that you feel passionate about, that you feel you can contribute to, no matter how small they are, they mean something to you. And that's what you've got to take out of this. And that's what you must take out of this whole day's presentation that you've, that you've 
gathered here, all that knowledge, all that information has got to be put to useful work. Absorb it, analyze it, go back and figure out, you know what, there's valid validity, validity to all of this, and there is something in it for me, and I know that out of this I will become a much stronger and better person. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.